Okay, let's start. So again, welcome everyone to today's central exercise class. As usual, our chat channel will be moderated and today's moderator is once again, Leslie Fernandez. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the central exercises once again. Yeah, I'll be the one taking care of the chat. So whenever there is like an easy question I can answer immediately, I will try my best. And otherwise I will, I will collect them and like um, bring them to the, to the webinar whenever there is time for that. Okay, so let's start with uh, sheet number five then today. So topics of sheet number five, there basically are two topics for this sheet. The one is matrix inversion and the other one is determinants. And of course, these two are, are closely connected. So we'll have a look at those topics. Um, and I say we start with 5.1 right away. So I hope you can see my screen now. So that's C51. That one is about matrix inversion. So we have um, a matrix here that is the matrix A, a three by three matrix, one, four, minus two, two, nine, minus five, zero, zero, one. And the topic here is um, we, are, we are asked to compute the inverse of that matrix. And you hopefully all know how to do that. If you want an inverse of a matrix, what you do is you write down the matrix and you write an appropriate identity matrix next to that. So in this case, this is the I3. And then you're doing Gaussian elimination operations. Basically what you do here is you solve three um, systems of linear equations at the same time for the right-hand sides given here in the columns of this identity matrix. So each column of these identity matrix is one right-hand side and you solve all of these simultaneously. And what you do to solve this is you do a <clears throat> Gaussian elimination until the left-hand side is of the form I3. So you form this, uh, you re reformulate this to get an identity matrix. And if you did that correctly, the right-hand side will then be the inverse that you're looking for. So let's try to do this using this example here. So we have this matrix here, one, four, minus two, two, nine, minus five, and zero, zero, one. And the right-hand sides are the columns of our identity matrix. So it looks like this. And now let's reformulate that to get an identity matrix on the left. So what we do is first we do the usual Gaussian elimination to um, obtain echelon form. So in this example, we'd use this here as our first pivot element. And then we'd subtract four times the first row from the second. And we would add two times the first row to the third to obtain uh, zeros here below that pivot element. And if we do that, let's see, what do we get? We copy the first row, also the right-hand sides, of course. Then in the second row, we get uh, four minus four, that's zero. Then we get uh, nine minus four times two. So uh, nine minus eight, that's one. And zero minus zero, that's of course zero. Don't forget the right-hand sides as usual. Zero minus four is minus four. And we have one minus zero and zero minus zero, that doesn't change. Then for the third row, we get minus two plus two, that's again zero. Here we have minus five plus two times two, so minus five plus four, that's minus one. Um, and one plus zero, that's one. And for the right-hand sides, we get uh, two, zero, and one. So that's the first step. Second step, let's take this here as our next pivot element and 
add the second row to the last row to get rid of this minus one entry here. <clears throat> and doing that, we get, again, the first row, we could just copy that one. The second row does not change in this step either, so we copy that one as well. And the new third row will be zero, zero, one. And the right-hand side, let's see, two minus four, that is minus two, um, one and one. Okay, so now we have obtained echelon form, as you can see. And um, we need to go one step further now. We need to obtain the identity matrix on the left-hand side. So we kind of need to do this all backwards as well. Next step we could do is we would use this here as our next pivot element, and then reduce all entries above that to zero. That is already the case here. So this first step is not even necessary. That means we can go right to the next step, which would be to use this as our pivot element and then reuse all the entries above that to zero. So this two here that has to go. And we would obtain that by simply subtracting two times the second row from the first one. So what do we get then? Now the first row changes. The new first row is one. Um, here we get two minus two, that's zero. And here we have zero minus zero. And on the right-hand side, we get uh, one minus two times minus four. So that's minus, that's one plus eight, so nine. Then zero minus two, so that's minus two. And zero minus zero, that's a zero. Now the second row did not change, so we keep that as it is, and the third row did not change. So we copy that one. Right, and now you notice we have the identity matrix here on the left. So this is I3. And that means this matrix here, this is now the inverse of A. You notice it's A to the minus one. So here's our result. A to the minus one is nine minus two zero, minus four one zero, and minus two one one. Okay, so that's our desired result. Um, let's quickly check if that is actually correct. <clears throat> so if that is correct, then A times A to the minus one, or A to the minus one times A, um, those should all be the identity matrix. And that's easy to check here. So A times A to the minus one, that would be, let's see, A is uh, one, four, minus two, two, nine, minus five, zero, zero, one. And A to the minus one is nine, minus four, minus two, minus two, one, one, and zero, zero, one. And the result of this matrix multiplication Let's see, we start with the first row here and multiply this by the first column on the right. So that is nine minus eight plus zero, nine minus eight is one. Then we do the second column here and the first row on the left. So that is uh, minus two plus two plus zero, that's zero. And finally, the third column 0, 0, 1 times this first row, that is 0 plus 0 plus 0. And the same for the second row on the left. Again, if we multiply this by this column here, we get, let's see, 4 times 9 is 36, minus 4 times 9, that's 0, plus 0, that's 0. Then we have minus 8 plus 9 plus 0, so that's 1. And finally, this column here, um, zero times four plus zero times nine plus zero times one, that is zero, of course. And last but not least, the last row. <clears throat> Multiply this by the first row, that is zero, zero, one, 
Multiplying this with the first column yields um, minus 18 plus 20, that's two, minus two, that is zero. Multiplying with this column, we obtain uh, four minus five, that's minus one plus one, that is zero. And that looks good. This column, last one, that is zero plus zero plus one. So indeed, that's exactly what we wanted as the identity matrix here. So seems our result is actually correct. Okay, so that's how you compute inverse matrices. And of course that works for matrices of arbitrary sizes. Uh, it just gets a little more work. Let's see if there are any questions so far. Uh, yes, there, there are. Um, one of the question is uh, what, haps, what happens if we get a zero row after using Gaussian elimination? Okay, what happens if we get a zero row after using Gaussian elimination? Let's do a quick example for that. Like I just do a two by two matrix, huh? an easy one like this one. Let's say you wanted to compute the inverse of this one. Then what we do is we'd subtract two times the first row here. We get uh, first row copied and then we get zero, zero minus two, one. Um, and at this point, we can see that there is no way we're going to get a, an identity matrix on the left because we have this zero row. We, we cannot undo that. Um, well, what that means is that the matrix on the left, in this case, has rank one. We only have one pivot element, right? So if this is our matrix here, the rank of this one is one not two. So this matrix doesn't have full rank. And that means there is no inverse. So one, one, two, two has no inverse. And you can see that in the Gaussian elimination process whenever something like this happens. So when you get this zero row, um, you have proof that the matrix doesn't have full rank. So you can't invert it. Um, and you don't have to check this beforehand. You can just start the elimination process. And if the matrix cannot be inverted at some point, something like this will happen. And that's when you stop uh, and just say, obviously the matrix doesn't have full rank, so there is no inverse and we can stop here. So that could happen, of course. Okay, there is another question that uh, it says, I, I mean, I'm not really sure I understood properly, this is why I'm asking here, why are we solving the system of linear equations for three hand size at the same time? So basically what we want to do is, um, we have this matrix A, three by three matrix in this case, we want to determine a matrix A to the minus one, so we don't know this yet, such that this product is I3. Uh, basically, each column of this I3 here is determined by one column of this I to the minus one. So imagine we have this matrix A. Uh, let me write that down once again. Numbers don't really matter, but still. So this matrix here, two, nine, minus five, and zero, zero, one. Um, and then we have these columns here in A to the minus one, yeah? Like we, we want this column, we want this column, and we want this column. Um, and multiplying the green column, for example, multiplying this column with this left-hand side matrix rows, so these rows times this column, that would yield the first column of the resulting matrix, right? So the result of this one needs to be one, zero, zero the result of the orange column um, needs to be zero, one, zero. And for the blue column, we should get zero, zero, one. Yeah, so we have to determine entries for the, uh, for the colored dots that have this property here. So basically what we're doing is we're solving three equation systems. So for example, the green equation system that would be this one here and then 
with uh, the right hand side being one zero zero, right? Solving this would give us this three dots here, right? And then of course we can do the same thing for the oranges, for the orange colors and for the blue color. Um, so basically what we do is we solve the same equation system three times. The only difference is the right-hand side. In this case, we have this right-hand side. For the orange dots here, we'd use this right-hand side. And for the blue dots, we use this right-hand side. And we can do this all at the same time because the manipulations we need to do on the left are always the same. The right-hand sides don't influence those. And basically that's what we do here. So we just use these three right-hand sides here at the same time here always with the same left-hand side. So what this method does is it solves three equations at the same time, or in general, n equations if the matrix um, is n-dimensional. I hope that was the question that you asked. Uh, there is a question that it says whether they, they always need to check uh, that A, I mean like, X, like A multiplied by the inverse is the identity. This, no, no, you don't have to check this, of course. Yeah? If, your, if your computations are correct, then this, of course, should be implied. You don't have to check that every time. I just did that to make sure that my uh, computations were right here. Okay, there are no more questions. Okay, great. <clears throat> and then let's move on to 5.2 then. This one is about determinants. So here we have uh, four different matrices and uh, the task is to determine the determinants of those matrices. So let's start with A. Let's say we need to determine the determinant of this matrix here, four, zero, zero, nine, four, one, two, seven, one, two, eight, six, and zero, 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 five. Okay, you know a number of methods to compute determinants. So I'll just demonstrate some of these now. Um, you notice this is a four by four matrix. So one method that you cannot use is Saru's rule. Please keep in mind that Saru's rule is only possible for three by three matrices. That's an error that is unfortunately often found on the exams. Yeah, it doesn't work for four by four matrices. Don't try that. So the most clever method in this case is probably Laplacian expansion. At least I would try that first. The reason for that is that we find this column here that has three zeros and only one non-zero entry, this one here. And if we do Laplacian expansion, with respect to this column, then most of the entries will just disappear. So that's why I'm going to do this first in the first step. Now, how does this work? What you do is the following. <clears throat> you take all of the entries in the column or in the row that you selected, and for each of those, you get a determinant that is reduced in dimension by one. Um, each of these entries is preceded by the entry here. So we first take this five here, and then we multiply. Um, next factor is the sign, that sign changes, and you can always get that sign by computing minus one to the power of current row plus current column. So in this case, this is row four and column four. So we get minus one to the power of four plus four. Yeah, so that way you don't have to count anything in the matrix, you just take the row and the column and you get your sign right. And then final step in Laplacian expansion, um, you again take this entry and you remove the corresponding column and the corresponding row from the matrix. 
you just take what is left. So in this case, what is left is this part here. And that constitutes the last factor, the determinant of this part here. So determinant of 400, 412, 128. Right, and you would repeat this for every entry on this um, selected column or row. In this case, of course, what you get is, well, if you take this entry, for example, you will get plus zero times whatever. Yeah, we don't really care what is, um, what is following that zero times because whatever that is, the result will always be zero. And that's why it's so convenient in this case to do Laplacian expansion. And of course that's true for the other entries as well. So it would be a summoned corresponding to this entry here. Again, that's plus zero times something and there would be an entry corresponding to this here. And again, that is zero and whatever comes next, we can just disregard that. Okay, so we've reduced the dimension by one. We're at a three by three matrix now instead of four by four. And of course we can repeat this process as often as necessary. Um, or we can also switch to some other process if we'd like to. Now let's first uh, complete the expansion process and then maybe we can discuss possible alternatives. So in this case, we have uh, five minus one to the power of eight is plus one. So we can just disregard this one. And then we have this determinant here. And again, if you look closely, you'll see that there is one column, this one here, that has only one non-zero entry. So we'll again do Laplacian expansion this time with respect to the first column. What we get then is four, this entry here in, in that position here, times minus one, this is the first row and the first column. So it's one plus one times the matrix that we get when we delete this row and this column. So what is left would then be this matrix here. So we get times the determinant of one, two, two, eight. And again, the other factors here are zero and zero. So there's not a lot to do for those. And well, finally, let's see, we get uh, four times five, that is 20 minus one to the power of two is plus one. And this determinant here, two by two, we can compute that directly. Um, remember that is the product of these two entries minus the product of these two entries. So that's one times eight minus two times two. Um, so what we get is 20 times what, eight minus four, that's four. So the result is 80 and that should be correct, yeah. Okay, so this gives us 80 as a final result. Okay, so this is one possibility of computing a determinant. Any questions about this one already? Um, there is a question that it says, do we have to show how to determine the negative positive sign or can we just use a mnemonic image? Sorry, can we use what? Yeah, mnemonic image. Uh, I kind of had to Google it as well and I still don't have it very clear. Okay, so you're probably referring to something like, I mean, there's, there's this uh, image that shows the sign for each of the entries like this. Uh, and so the, the rule here is to start with plus one in the upper left corner and then just alternate as you walk along rows and columns. So let's complete this. Um, and that shows you the sign for each entry. And of course you can also just use that if you find that easier. I personally prefer the method using minus one to the rows plus columns because I don't have to think about it, especially for entries that are not near the top left corner. 
Yeah, so that, but that's just my preference. Anything else is fine too. Any more questions? Yeah, there is a question that it says, why is it not negative? Why is what not negative? Yeah, I am not sure the, what. The determinant. Well, did I mess up somewhere? I don't really see why it would be negative. I mean, we get that factor is surely positive. That is positive. This is positive. This is positive. And of course, eight minus four, that's also positive. So I don't really get why this would be negative. If you got a negative result, uh, one of us messed up somewhere. It's No, it's minus one to the power of two is one. This is why it becomes positive. Yeah, right, minus one. So this one here, minus one to the power of two, one plus one, that is plus one. Same here, minus one to the power of eight is plus one. Yeah, and there are no more questions. Um, there are a couple of questions in the very beginning regarding whether the exam would be online or not of the quiz, but I have not them and I will bring them at the end of the uh, session. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, let's discuss those at the end, yeah. Okay, so far everything fine. Okay, good. Let's have a look at part B then. So uh, in B, we are asked to compute the determinant of, let's see, 4, 4, 1, 0, 0, 2, 8, 0, 9, 7, 6, 5. That's a 9 here, it's not very clear. And 0, 1, 2, 0. Okay, and if you look closely at that matrix here, you will hopefully see um, it's fairly similar to the one that we had in A, right? So 4410, this line is the same. This line here, 0120, that happens to be the last line here. Then we have 0280, that's here. And the last line in A, that is the third row of this matrix here. So that is almost the same matrix as in part A, but the lines are in a different order now. So a possible strategy here would be to just use the result that we already have from A and reformulate the matrix such that we can get back our matrix of A. Now, basically, you can apply Gaussian operations to determinants, but you have to watch out for a few things here. Um, one is if you change the order of rows, if you swap any two rows, then the sign of the determinant will change. So if you swap two rows, the determinant sign will change to a minus if it was a plus before or vice versa. Um, and we'll, we'll use just that. What we have to do here is we just have to swap rows to get to the matrix that we are already know the determinant of. Um, <clears throat> so the first row, that's fine already. That's also in uh, that place in our matrix of part A. So that just states where it is. Um, for the second and third row, you'll notice, <clears throat> sorry, you notice that we need to change something here. Um, the third row of our matrix A, this one here, is the second row here. So let's swap this down first. First operation we're doing is we swap these two to get the third row right. So this is the same determinant, I'm sorry, same determinant as 4410, we just copy that. We also copy the last row and then we flip those two over. So this is 9765 and 0280. And now this new determinant will be the negative of the one before. So to make up for that, we'll have to add a minus sign in front of the determinant, right? Yeah, so, so that one here flips its sign and we reflip it by adding a minus. So in effect, these, these two matrices, these two determinants are the same. So next step, 
Now the first and the third row are correct already. Um, but the second and the fourth are still interchanged. So what we do next is we swap these two rows here. And that means we again change the sign of the determinant. And to make up for that, we again have to add a minus. And of course, we also keep the old one. And now the new, I'm sorry, the new determinant. Um, we keep the first row where it is. We keep the third row and we interchange the fourth. So this becomes the new second row and the second row, the old second row becomes the new fourth row. So this is our new matrix. And this is exactly the matrix that we had in point A. And you remember the value of that was 80. So we have minus one times minus one, that's plus one again, times this old determinant. So what we get is plus 80 once again. The value is the same as it was in A. Okay, so remember if you, if you flip um, rows or also columns, then you have to change the sign of the determinant. Otherwise you're free to do that. Questions? Um, there was a question in the very beginning that I'm sorry, I didn't see it. It says if a matrix is in virtual, isn't it always an option to get a determinant equal to one? Can't we always generate a triangular form with only one mm -hmm. on the diagonal? Actually, let, let me get back to that uh, in part D. Okay. If I forget about it, please, please remember me. Mm -hmm. Remind me. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of questions. What exactly does the determinant represent? Yeah, we didn't talk about that a lot. So um, for what we did, the determinant basically is a measure that represents if a matrix can be inverted or not. If the determinant is zero, the matrix cannot be inverted and otherwise it can be inverted. Of course, it does a lot more than that. And we'll actually make use of that in math too when we discuss this a little more closely. Um, you can also interpret a determinant in a geometric way. And then it's a volume, a volume of a certain body that is spanned by the columns of the matrix. But uh, I didn't go into detail on that because mostly we don't need it here in math one. Um, so I'd like to defer this to math two. That would lead a little too far right now. What happens if you swap columns? If you sort columns? So if you, if you swap columns, if you change their order, uh, it's the same. So whether you exchange the order of rows or of columns um, doesn't make a difference. If you swap two columns, again, the sign of the determinant changes. So it pretty much behaves the same way for rows as for columns, um, which is also reflected in a formula that you hopefully know the determinant of the transpose matrix is the same as the determinant of the matrix itself. So whether you work on rows or columns is not really relevant. You can transpose any time without changing anything. And one last question. It says, are you able to carry out Laplace and expansion on the on matrix B without changing the rows? Uh, Laplace and expansion on B without changing the rows, of course. Yeah. Why wouldn't I? So. I think what they meant is like, I mean, instead of like in part A, we started with the pivot element in, in position four, four. Mm -hmm. And like whether they could also do the same in this case, instead of like having five on four, four, they have it on row three and column four. But I mean, it works exactly the same way. Works. So let me just show you the first step to see how this works. And I hope you can fill in the gaps and for yourself. Um, so in this case, this is the matrix um, of B. If we want to do Laplacian expansion again with respect to the last column, because that has the most zero entries, um, then what we will get is we can have this entry five here. So we get five, oops, sorry, five times then the sign. In this case, this is column four and the row three. 
right? So my sine would now be minus one to the four plus three. And the new determinant that I get, I would obtain by um, deleting this column and this row here. So the entries that make up my new matrix are these here, those will remain, and the last one, this row here. So the new matrix will look like this, 4, 4, 1, 0, 2, 8, and then 0, 1, 2. Okay, so you notice I have a minus one here instead of a plus one before, but also this matrix still looks a little different um, and that will make up for the minus sign. So if you continue the process in the same way, then you should get the same result. It will again be 80. Okay, so let's just write this. I hope that is sufficient to answer your question. There is a question that it says, how do we write it down if we use Saro's rule after first Laplace step? So if you want to use Saro's rule after first, well, why not do it? <clears throat> so what you do in Saro's rule is um, basically you take a three by three matrix like the one that we have here and you add these two columns at the end or you at least imagine you added these two columns at the end. You don't have to write it down if you can do it without. Um, and then you would take diagonals. You would take this diagonal, this one, and this one with a plus sign. And you would take these here with the corresponding minus sign. So uh, there's a minus here associated to those. So uh, what you'd get if you do this is, let's see, first the positive part, you would multiply the entries along each diagonal. So here we have four times two times two, that's uh, four times four, that's 16. Then we have uh, four times eight times zero, that's zero. And then we have one times zero times one, that's also zero. So those are the positive diagonals. And then you subtract the negative ones until we have one times two times zero, that's zero. Then we get um, four times eight times one, uh, that's 32. And finally, uh, whatever here, four times zero times two, that's zero again. And of course, let's write that in front actually, we still have that, um, that minus five right here. So forget about this one. <clears throat> so I hope that is all correct now. Uh, so. So that would be, let's see, minus five. Uh, here we have 16. Here we have minus 32. So that is minus five times minus 16. And that is in fact plus 80, if I'm not mistaken. So that is the way that Saru's rule works. But remember, you can only use this for three by three matrices, nothing else. So you would have to do at least one Laplacian expansion step before that. There are no more questions, so we can continue. Okay, so let's continue with uh, the matrix in part C then. That's actually the easiest one. So part C, um, that is the determinant of, let's write that down, 5, 19, 9, 9, 7, 2, 7, 7, 11, 8, 6, 6, 13, minus 27, 5, 5. <clears throat> So, and if you look at that matrix closely, then you should be able to see that 
these last two rows are actually identical. So that tells you out of the four rows here, at least these two are linearly dependent. And then of course the set of all four is also linearly dependent, meaning the matrix does not have four linearly independent rows. And thus the row, uh, sorry, the rank of that matrix cannot be four. So that's the one observation that I need to make here is the rows are linearly dependent. Or in other words, you could using Gaussian operations produce a zero row here. So that means the rank of that matrix is strictly less than four, it doesn't have full rank. And that means it cannot be inverted And that in turn means the determinant of that matrix must be zero. So you don't have to do any computations once you spot something like this, right? If you, if you find the rows or the columns of a matrix are linearly dependent, then you can just write down your observation and state right away the determinant must be zero then. So that's, I think the easiest solution for part C. Any questions on that one? Not in that one, but maybe if you could quickly go to part B, there is a question that it says in the determinant of the three times three matrix, which is shown, you cannot multiply the last row by minus two. I'm sorry, you, I can multiply the last row by minus two? But you cannot. Then also the determinant changes. Not that yeah, one. so let me, let me quickly write that one down. Um, so I have this 441, let's see. Um, I have this 441, what was it? Two, two, zero, two, eight, zero, one, two. Zero, two, eight, zero, one, two. So if I have this determinant here and you want to multiply the uh, third row by two, then of course the value of the determinant will change. So if I do this, then I have a different matrix here and the determinant also changed by a factor of two, right? So I'm multiplying one row or one column by any factor, the determinant will change by that factor. So this new determinant here, this is two times the value of this old determinant. So to make up for that, I would have to add a factor of one over two to compensate for that, right? And now the values are of course the same again, and you are free to do that if you want to. Um, but please note that, that uh, multiplying a row or a column of a matrix by some value will change the, the value of the determinant. And you'd have to compensate for that. I, I hope that was the question or that answers the question. There is a question related to that. It says, when do we use the triangular form? When do we use it? So let's get to part D because that one uses a triangular form. Um, and I'll demonstrate using this here. So in part D, we have to compute the determinant of the following matrix, 0, 10, 0, 0. 0, 2, 0, 2, 5, 8, 0, minus 6, 3, minus 27, 3, and 15. And of course, you can use multiple methods to compute this determinant. One of them would be the plus and expansion. For example, if you look at this column here or this row here, then the plus and expansion is a totally valid strategy. I opted for going for the triangular form here just to demonstrate how this works. So the idea is to use Gaussian operations to reformulate that matrix in a way such that it is triangular, usually upper triangular, but you can also go for lower triangular. And once you have a triangular matrix, then the determinant is just the product of the entries on the diagonal. And that's what we we'll use here. So first operation, 
we have this 10 here in the first column. We'd like to have that as a first pivot element and that's why we're moving it up to the first row. And of course, doing this, as you know, changes the value of the determinant. Swapping two rows changes the sign. So we make up for that by adding a minus in front of it. So that's the same as minus. And then we have this new first row here. And the new second row is the former first row. Sorry, like this. And we won't change the last two rows for now. Okay, so that's the first operation that we need to do here. Then we have this pivot element already. There's zeros below there, so we're good here. Next, we'll take this as our pivot element. And to do this, we have to move this up to the second row. So we'll exchange those two. So that's going to be the determinant of 10 to 8 minus 27. The new second row is then 0, 2, minus 6, 15. The third row, we didn't touch that. So still 0, 0, 0, 3. And uh, the new last row is 0, 0, 5, 3. And actually let me add that explicitly here. Um, you notice we again swap two rows. So we still have this this uh, orange minus one here from before. And now we again swap two rows. So we have to multiply this again by minus one. Okay. So we have zeros here, we have zeros here. So we almost get last step, last pivot element would be this one here. And again, we just have to make a row swap and that would now lead to minus one. We already have two of those. We add a third one now. So we have minus one to the power of three. And the new determinant will be, the new matrix, sorry, will be this one. Uh, we don't change those rows. We don't change the second row. When we exchange the last and the next to last row. So this new one is um, 0, 5, 3. And the new third row is 0, 0, 3, like this. And now we have triangular form or echelon form. And the entries on the diagonal are these here, 10, 2, 5, and 3. So, what we get here is as the value of the determinant minus one to the power of three times, and that uh, determinant is then 10 times two times five times three. So the value is uh, 10 times two times five is 10. So 10 times 10 times three, that's 300 and a minus sign minus 300 is the right value. So in this case, it's worth doing only, um, only row exchanges and you just have to pay attention to change the minus sign. Um, of course, you could also do Gaussian operations. You, you are allowed to uh, add or subtract multiples of a row to some other row without changing the value of the determinant. So that does nothing to the determinant. Um, if you multiply a row or a column by some constant, then the value will change by exactly that constant. So same as we did before, right here, if we multiply, for example, the last row by two, then the value of the determinant changes and the new one has twice the value of the old one. So we need to make up for that. Yeah, just be sure to get this right. Don't multiply by two, because that is multiplied by two already. Um, so in that case, you have to pay attention a little um, Whereas if you just add or subtract rows from other rows or columns, 
um, that works without changing the value of the determinant. So usually I try to restrict my operations to these, swapping rows, swapping columns, and adding rows to other rows or multiples of rows to other rows. Um, I usually don't multiply a row by something because that's, that's easy to mess up. I try to avoid that. But of course, if you have that under control, you're free to do that. So I hope that answers this question. Um, any other questions? Um, no, oh, there is no. <clears throat> Great. Good. So I trust you all know how to compute determinants then. Um, there's some more practice material on that sheet. So if uh, you feel you need more practice with one method or the other, of course, you can use any method you like for any of the determinants on that sheet. So just go ahead and practice and uh, they should all give you the same results, of course. If they don't, feel free to ask the tutorials and uh, we'll try to help you there. So let's have a look at um, C53 then. So here we have a matrix A lambda. <clears throat> so that depends on a parameter now. It's a simple three by three matrix or so not too complex, hopefully. And uh, the question here is, for which values of lambda can that matrix be inverted? Uh, what does the inverse look like? Actually, A is easy to answer, while B is, um, yeah, is probably meaning some work for us to do. So for A, if we're just asking whether a matrix can be inverted or not, you don't have to compute the inverse. And uh, imagine B was not there, and only A was the question, then you should not bother computing the inverse. What you should do is you should compute the determinant and see if that is zero. So what we'll do is we'll find all the lambdas where the determinant is zero. And of course, to do that, we have first have to compute the determinant. So let's do that. <clears throat> Um, and just as an illustration, we will use the Gaussian method at least once um, for this one here. So, of course, you can always mix and match methods as you like. Um, there's not, 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 not a single zero in there. So um, expansion is at this point probably not a very clever idea. Um, so let's first try to get a few more zeros into that matrix. And one thing that suggests itself basically you have this one entry up here that makes for a very good pivot element. So let's try to produce zeros below that one element using Gaussian elimination steps. And then maybe we can use Laplacian expansion. So that's the first thing we're going to try. We don't have to do any row exchanges. We keep the first row as it is. And then for the second row, we have to subtract lambda times the first row. And now notice that I don't have to make any case distinction here because if lambda is zero, I'm just not doing anything and that's fine. Yeah, I'm subtracting zero times, well, nothing happens. Um, and again, if I'm doing Gaussian eliminations in this way, add or subtract a multiple of some row to some other row, the, the determinant does not change at all. So I can do this freely. Um, and that would be lambda minus lambda that is zero. Then I get four minus lambda times lambda. So four minus lambda squared. And here I get four minus two lambda. And uh, for the last row, I could just subtract two times the first row. And that yields a zero here, uh, a four minus two lambda here, and a seven minus four, that's just three. Okay, 
And so now I have two zeros in that first column. And at this point, I would do Laplacian expansion. So what we get here is only an entry for this first one here. All the others will be zero. So that's one times the sign is minus one to the power of one plus one, row one, column one. So we have one plus one. And then we get the determinant of, let's see. Um, so we delete the first column and the first row here. So the determinant of this part here is what's left. So this is, uh, oh, sorry. This is four minus lambda squared, four minus two lambda, four minus two lambda, and three. And actually we could perform, we could try to perform a little trick here. Um, so if you look closely at, no, actually no. No, let's forget about that. <clears throat> not a good idea. Um, we have a two by two matrix now, so let's not bother too much with that, with that um, and just uh, use the formula for two by two determinants like this. Um, so we have one times one, um, and then we have this determinant here, which is, let's see, um, three times four minus lambda squared minus four minus two lambda times four minus two lambda, so it's four minus two lambda squared. Okay, um, and that would be, uh, let's see, three. Um, four minus lambda squared is two minus lambda times two plus lambda. And here we have four minus two lambda squared. We can take out a two. So that would be two squared times two minus lambda squared. And that means we can, uh, we can now factor out a two minus lambda here. And that leaves us with, uh, with three and this factor here. So that is, uh, well, let's actually do that in two steps. And here we have four squared, that's four, uh, two squared, sorry, two squared, that's four times two minus lambda. So one is left. So two minus lambda, and then we get, let's see, six plus three lambda minus eight, plus four lambda. So that is two minus, sorry, not two minus seven, of course, two minus lambda. And here we have, uh, let's see, that's minus two plus seven lambda, right? So that means the determinant of a lambda is zero if and only if either of these factors here is zero. And uh, the first one is simply zero if lambda is two. And the second one, so this is zero for lambda equals two. And the second one that is zero for let's see, lambda equals two over seven. So that's our second factor here. And that means the matrix is invertible for all lambdas that are not two or two over seven. So for lambda in the reals with the exception of two and two over seven. And that would be the answer to part A. Question so far. Okay, there is, um, there is a question that it says, if I know it is two, then I can stop, but I don't really get where. If you know what, sorry? Maybe, Niklas, could you please rephrase that again? If I know it is two, then I can stop. If 
you know it is two. Ah, uh, if you know that lambda is equal to two, but no. So the question here is for which lambda is um, the matrix invertible? And that of course means you have to find all the lambdas for which it is not invertible, right? So knowing that it's not invertible for two is not the full answer. You also have to find out that it's not invertible for two over seven. So you can't stop once you have that factor of two. If that is a question, otherwise please just rephrase and we'll try to answer again. Okay, then there is a question that it says, I know you have addressed it, but I am confused again. Isn't it minus one times the determinant because minus one to the power of two is, okay, minus one to the power of an even number, it's always plus one. Yes. Minus one to the power of two is still plus one. Yes, I've used that extensively. So minus one to the power of two is minus one times minus one. Minus one times minus one is plus one. And that works for every even number, of course. Yeah. So minus one to any even power is always plus one. And minus one to any odd power is always minus one. And I use that in, in numerous places. Okay, then there is, there is a question that it says, doing Gaussian elimination and looking at when the pivot elements are zero, I get also minus two as a result. Oh, you get minus two. So you probably did something wrong then. Yeah, yeah. So minus two, yeah, minus two. I mean, if lambda is equal to minus two, still the determinant could be not equal to zero, so it could be invertible, right? I'd say so, unless yeah. of course I have made a grave mistake, but I, I don't hope I have. Then it says whether it could be possible to solve this exercise as well using the Saros rule. Of course, yeah, you can also use Saros rule to compute this determinant here, yeah. I personally, I find this is the easier way because um, I'm having a hard time concentrating hard enough to actually master Saros rule. But if that works for you, that's of course fine. I usually mess up if I'm trying to do that. Okay, then I forgot in the previous um, um, in exercise. Wait a second, wait a second. There are more questions coming. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but um, I also get the result as negative. Okay, well, I mean, just probably have a look at it again. Like, We'll have a look at that again, and I'll make sure my results are right before I um, post these suggested solutions. Um, and I suggest if uh, we're still having different results, then maybe compare your solution to mine and see if you can spot your error or my my error. Um, if you can, please just post your solution suggestion to the forum, and uh, we might have a look at that. Yeah, I, I can. I can now while going through. Questions I can quickly compute it in MATLAB with minus two and see whether the determinant is zero or not. And then yeah, maybe if you have time, you can give that a try. Yeah. So, yeah. so part B will take quite a while. So maybe you have time during that one. Um, okay, there is another question. Um, my calculator, okay, I mean, minus one to the power of any even number, it's plus one. I mean, um, maybe you have to write it in the calculator minus one between brackets. So, but the middle yeah, so element that's... lambda square. So if you set minus two, the element gets zero. I don't really see what any, what, what gets zero. I don't, I don't really so get either. I, I suggest um, I'll try to do part B. Maybe an error pops up when I do this. And uh, if you can, I will time you can right away. Verify this and, and then, I mean, we forgot to answer the question that it should have been answered after like for uh, exercise 5.2D, but I will come back to that after this exercise again. The one with the determinant uh, always being one. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's give that a quick answer then. <clears throat> um, so let's just make up some, some uh, determinant here. So let's say we have a determinant. I just use a two by two matrix. That's easier. Uh, something like uh, like this here. One, 
Um, and let's make this minus one, for example, right? So you want this determinant, and uh, then you're saying we can always force um, the determinant to one. Let's hope this is not one by coincidence. Um, so I'm, I'm doing a first Gaussian elimination step by subtracting two times the first row here. Um, and I get two one for the first row that doesn't change. And this will be zero and minus one minus two. So we get minus three here. It's hopefully correct. Okay, and now you can see the determinant is two times minus three, that's minus six. Now, your argument was, I, I, if I got this right, your argument was I can now multiply the rows or the columns of that matrix um, by the correct factors to get ones on the diagonal. And now if I'm doing that, for example, I could multiply the first row by one over two to get a one in this position here, right? So that would yield one here one over two here. It doesn't really matter for the determinant. But of course, now I change the matrix. I multiply this by one over two. And if I multiply a row by one over two, then the determinant changes by the same factor. So if I keep this old row here, that new determinant is now half of the old one. So I have to make up for this by multiplying by two. So basically what I do is I'm taking this factor two out of the first row. And that's, you can do that of course. And I can do the same thing for the, for the third row. I can multiply this by minus one over three if you want to. Um, and what I'm doing, what I'm getting here is then uh, two times determine, uh, sorry, I need to leave some space here times the determinant of the first row is not changed. The second row then becomes zero plus one. But again, if I'm doing this, the value of the determinant changes. The new value is minus one third, the old value. And I have to make up for that. So I need to multiply this all by minus three by the inverse of minus one over three. Um, and now you have a matrix here that has determinant one, yeah, because it, it is a triangular matrix and you can just multiply the entries on the diagonal. Those are all one. So the determinant of that is one, that's true. But remember we have taken out these factors here. So we have, we still have two at minus three times one. So the determinant is minus six. So even though you have reformulated the matrix in a way such that its determinant is one, um, you need to account for the fact that these operations here change the value of the determinant, right? You cannot just do this without taking out these relevant factors. So that, that's not adding a multiple of one row to some other row, but that is multiplying one row by a constant factor. And that does change the value of the determinant accordingly. So if you pay attention to taking out these factors, then that's totally fine. You can do that. But of course, the value of a determinant will in the end be determined by those factors and it will not generally be one. I hope that answers this question. Anything else at the moment? Uh, I did compute that the determinant with lambda equal to minus two in MATLAB and it's minus 64. So in particular, it's not zero, I'm relieved. Yeah, then there is, a, there is a kind of like a confusion that it says that, I mean, by um, inserting lambda equal to minus two in this, so in the determinant that we have already like um, made the first modifications. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Like where are we somewhere yeah, here, maybe, right? Yeah, uh, so, this one here. Right, yeah. So if lambda is equal to minus two, we get four minus lambda squared would be equal to zero, right? And oh. ah, okay, but four, I mean, the, it's, it's not a triangular. Um, no, it's not a triangle. Let me just copy that and actually um, yeah. substitute that so we can see what happens. Okay. <clears throat> so if I'm, if I'm substituting lambda equals minus two, right? 
No, so what I get is, well, this first column doesn't have a lambda. Here we, let's make those green. Here we have a minus two. That two is constant, that three is constant as well. And then we have four minus lambda squared. Minus two squared is four. So that will be four minus four, that's a zero. Um, and here we have four minus two lambda. Minus two times minus two is four. So we get four plus four. So it means we'll have eight here and the same entry here, of course. So this is not a diagonal matrix. We still have this eight entry right here. Okay. So maybe that's what confused you. So this, this factor here is not, does not become zero. It will become zero for lambda equals two, but not for minus two. Okay, I hope that solves the problem with lambda equal to minus two. And then there is, uh, there is an opinion that it says, if you try the Sarus rule, it's a lot easier, at least in my opinion, if you can solve the Mitternacht formula. Well, you can take your opinion. I'll keep my opinion. Both are fine. Yeah, feel free to, to use whatever method works best for you as long as you do it correctly. Okay, there are no more questions so far. Okay, good. So let's give B a try. And as I said, that's going to be quite some work. Uh, so we'll compute the inverse as a function of lambda where possible. And uh, the intention of this is actually to warn you against just computing the inverse if it's not really necessary to do though. Um, so as you can see, you can, you can solve A without computing the inverse. Of course, if the question is really, if B is included, then you can try computing the inverse and you will automatically get the cases where it doesn't work from that. But if that's not necessary, then please don't try. It's usually quite some work, especially if a parameter is involved. And we'll see that now. So I uh, hope I get everything correct. Feel free to stop me anytime I make a mistake. Uh, so this should be the original matrix. And we're going to invert that. So we are writing the identity matrix next to it. And then we do Gaussian operations to get the identity matrix on the left. So first operation, as we did before, we will subtract lambda times the first row from the second and two times the first row from the third. So this is going to be our first pivot element. It's even already a one, so that's very nice. So what happens? The first row, you can just copy that. Nothing changes here. The second row becomes zero. Four minus lambda squared and four minus two lambda. Then uh, the last row that becomes zero, four minus two, sorry, minus two lambda uh, and three. And let's do the right hand sides. So for the second row, <clears throat> we get um, minus lambda, one, zero. And for the third row, we get minus two, zero, one. So that's the first step. And now for the second step, what do we do for that? Um, as you can see, there is this factor with a lambda square in it here. And here we have a lambda without a square. So whatever you do, you have to um, subtract one of those. Um, we can try to simplify before we do that. So let's see if that helps. Um, you remember that we did something similar before when we solved for the roots of our equation. Uh, here we can factor out two minus lambda, and then we have two plus lambda left. And this four minus two lambda, this is actually the same as two, two minus lambda. And of course the same works here, two, two minus lambda. And we just keep three here. Okay. 
it's a minus sign actually. Okay, so you can see we have two minus lambda here and also two minus lambda here. And uh, we already know that the matrix is not invertible for lambda equals two and lambda equals two over seven. So we can't exclude those two cases. We know that lambda is not equal to two and lambda is not equal to two over seven. For all other cases, it will work, but we can make this assumption safely because of A. Okay, so what can we do now? Well, the next thing that we could do, for example, is we could use this here as a pivot element. You can see this is, at least this factor also appears here. So we have to multiply this by two plus lambda to get a zero here. And we have to factor out that two. That's not that hard. So this is probably the most clever thing we could do here. Um, that means we don't have to do division, at least not by something that involves lambda. So next step we do is we exchange those two routes to get the pivot in the right place. So one lambda two, copy the first row, then get this row here into the second place and this row here into the third place to two minus lambda and here we have uh, minus two zero one and minus lambda one zero. Okay, so now we take one over two times two plus lambda, the second row and subtract it from the third one. And that should yield a zero here. So this is now our pivot element. And as lambda is not equal to two, this is not zero. So we can take it as a pivot element. And let's see, that yields, um, we copy the first row once again. We also copy the second row. And for the third row, we get zero here. We get a zero here. And what do we have here? We have uh, two times two minus lambda minus, uh, well, this expression here, let's write it down before we do any more manipulations. Uh, two times two minus lambda is four minus two lambda, uh, sorry, minus two lambda. And then we subtract minus three over two times two plus lambda. And now for the right-hand side, we have minus lambda here, minus two times this. So minus two and minus one over two, this cancels out. So we have plus two plus lambda. Here we have zero plus one. So the one stays. And here we have zero plus one times this factor. So we get minus one over two, two plus lambda. Okay, let's simplify a little before we go on. One lambda two, one zero zero. So here we have two, two minus, sorry, two minus lambda, three, minus two, zero, one. And here, let's see, what do we get here? So here we have four minus two lambda. There's minus three over two times two, that's minus three. So four minus three, that would be one. And here we get minus three over two times lambda, minus two times lambda, that should be minus seven over two times lambda.
So hopefully that's correct. Um, and on the right-hand side, we have minus lambda plus two plus lambda. So that's just a two then. Here there's a one and here we have minus one, minus one, minus one over two lambda. Okay, so far so good. Now, remember lambda is not two over seven either. So that means this factor here, that is not zero as we excluded that case explicitly, yeah? If you didn't do that before, of course, at this point, you'd have to exclude that case or treat it differently. Um, so that means we can, um, in fact, divide by that factor. And we'll have to do that now to get a one in that position. So we multiply this by the inverse. Um, that is two minus seven, so that is, uh, that is two over two minus seven lambda. Okay. Now, what do we get? Let's keep our first row as it is. Keep our second row as it is. And the third row, zero, zero. Um, this one, this is two over two. So we have two minus seven lambda over two divided by the inverse. That's of course one. Now here two times this factor that is four over two minus seven lambda. One times this factor that is two over two minus seven lambda. Um, and finally here we have, let's see, minus, uh, let's just take out the minus and we have uh, two plus lambda over two, two plus lambda over two times two over two minus seven lambda like this. And of course this can be simplified by canceling out the two, right? <clears throat> so this means what we have here is really um, two plus lambda over minus two minus seven lambda. So that's seven lambda minus two. Okay, and now we have to do the backwards operations and you can imagine the expressions on the right are now really getting ugly. So next steps that we're going to do is we have to subtract three times the last row here and two times the last row here to get rid of this three and of this two here. So let's see if we can do this correctly. Um, first row, new first row is going to be, well, the left-hand side is easy. That's one lambda zero. Let's see about the right-hand side. That is one, let's write it down first before we simplify this. So one minus two times this entry here. So minus eight over two minus seven lambda. Then we have zero minus two times this entry here. So that's minus four over two minus seven lambda. And then we have zero minus two times this entry here. Um, and that is minus, uh, that is minus four minus two lambda over seven lambda minus two. Yeah, still looks half what decent. Um, second row, zero, two, two minus lambda, nothing happening there. Last entry becomes a zero. So for the right-hand side, we have minus two here and we subtract three times this entry. 
So that's minus two, minus 12 over two minus seven lambda. Then we have zero minus three times this entry here. Um, so that's minus six, two minus seven lambda. And finally, one minus three times this entry here. That is um, six plus three lambda over seven lambda minus two. Uh, yeah, I, did I mess up in the first one actually? Minus two, no. No, seems good. Um, and the last row, I can copy that. That did not change, thankfully. And two plus lambda, seven lambda minus two. Okay, we're getting closer. Now, um, next step we have to do is this last row, that's now perfect. The second row, we have this entry here that we need to get rid of or make it a one. So we have to divide that second row by the inverse of that value, uh, by, by that value. So we have to multiply by the inverse. So we multiply by two times two minus lambda. Maybe I can write this in a way that's actually readable. Two minus lambda, that's better. So we don't change the first row, one lambda zero. Um, and let's also take the opportunity to simplify a little if that's possible, let's see, one, um, that would be two minus seven lambda minus eight. So two minus eight is minus six over uh, two minus seven lambda. And we also have uh, minus seven lambda still. Uh, not much simplification to be done here. So we just copy that. And also here, that is just minus four minus two, two lambda over seven lambda minus one. Second row, we get zero, one, zero. And by the way, notice that this is possible because we know lambda is not two, right? So again, we've excluded that case before. If we had not done that, we would have to do it now. So second row is now good. Um, let's see that multiplication. So let's first simplify this a little. Um, so this here is minus, this here, minus two. It's the same thing as um, minus four plus 14 lambda over two minus seven lambda. So we have minus four minus 12, that's minus 16. Minus seven, lam minus 14 lambda, sorry. Minus 14 lambda over two minus seven lambda. And then we still need to multiply with this factor here. So we have a two and also a two minus lambda in here. And I'm running out of space. Um, same thing here, we have this minus six over two minus seven lambda times two times two minus lambda. And this entry here, let's try to simplify that first as well. Um, that one is seven lambda minus two over seven lambda minus two. So what do we get? Seven lambda minus three lambda, that's a four lambda. And then we get minus two minus six, that's minus eight over seven lambda minus two times two times two minus lambda. And let's Rewrite that so that I can later recognize the twos and the lambdas properly. Uh, Michael, um, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but in the yeah, 
Yeah, in the first element there where you have minus 16 minus 14 lambda. Yeah, should that be different? Uh, no, I think yes, like, I mean, it's minus two times minus seven, so I guess it should be plus 14 lambda. Yeah, that's right. Thanks a lot. Anything else? No. Okay, so just that you get the correction, we, we just change this to a plus from a minus. Whew. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Almost done. Um, so we're at the last row, we can just copy this one. Great. 4 over 2 minus 7 lambda, 2 over 2 minus 7 lambda, and 2 plus lambda over 7 lambda minus 2. So finally, uh, the last operation, we're going to subtract lambda times the second row from the first to get rid of this lambda entry here. So minus lambda times row two. And that should then be our final matrix. So I don't have to write down the left-hand side anymore, but uh, maybe I can do this in a, no, rather not. I'll add the left-hand side later on when I know how, how far apart the rows are. So <clears throat> let's see. We have, in the first row, we have um, a minus six minus seven lambda over two minus seven lambda. And now we get minus lambda times this, oops, sorry, times, come on, times this entry here. So that's a uh, minus lambda times minus 16 plus 14 lambda, 14 lambda over two minus seven lambda times two times two minus lambda. And I'll simplify all this later on. Uh, the next row is going to be minus four over two minus seven lambda minus lambda times this entry here. So that's uh, plus, sorry, come on, plus six lambda over two minus seven lambda times two times two minus lambda. And the last one is probably not going to fit in anymore. So this is column one, this is column two, and I'm afraid I'll have to move column three to the next row. Or maybe I can just move this all a little to the left. Let's see. Maybe that'll suffice. Um, so here we have um, minus four, minus, sorry, minus two lambda over seven lambda minus two minus lambda times four lambda minus eight over, yeah, I'll move the two out here, seven lambda minus two and two minus lambda belly. I hope we can read that later. So that's the third column. And again, the rest doesn't change. So we can uh, see if we can simplify something in the second row. We can, for example, cancel out a factor of two here already. So let's do that. Uh, we have minus eight plus seven lambda over two minus seven lambda and two minus lambda. Uh, again, we can cancel out a factor of two here. That yields, let's write it below the other one, that yields uh, minus three over two minus seven lambda and two minus lambda. And also for the last one, we factor out the two. So we get two, two lambda minus four over seven lambda minus two and two minus lambda. And uh, the last row is four over two minus seven lambda, two over two minus seven lambda 
and finally 2 plus lambda over 7 lambda minus 2. Okay, so what that means is the, uh, the inverse of our matrix. Um, as you can see, we can take out a factor of 2 minus 7 lambda everywhere, right? That's everywhere in all of these fractions. So let's start with that. So that's 1 over 2 minus 7 lambda. And then we write down whatever remains here. So that means um, we have minus 6 minus 7 lambda. We took out the factor here. Minus, then there is um, a factor of 2 that we can cancel out. And we have this lambda here. So uh, that's minus, let's see, 8, sorry, 8 lambda plus 7 lambda squared over, we took out the 2 minus 7 lambda, we canceled the 2, so we're left with 2 minus lambda. A lot more convenient. So here is minus 2, and we cancel out the factor of 2 here as well, so that means we get plus 3 lambda over 2 minus lambda. And for the last column, uh, we get minus four minus two lambda, two, sorry, minus two lambda. Um, we can again cancel out this factor of two here. And that means we get minus, let's see, two lambda minus four over two minus lambda, and uh, we have seven lambda minus two in here, and not two minus seven lambda. So there's a minus sign that we need to take out as well. So that makes this here a plus instead of a minus. Okay, rest should hopefully be a little easier. Um, two minus seven lambda, so that means we have minus eight plus seven lambda over two minus lambda. Here we have uh, minus three over two minus lambda. And here we have two lambda minus four over two minus lambda. And again, we have seven lambda minus two here and not two minus seven lambda. So there's a minus sign in front of that. And last row, that's a four, a two, and again, seven lambda minus two here in that last factor instead of the reverse. So this is minus two minus lambda. And I really hope I didn't mess up there. Um, I think we can just leave it at that. Of course, you can simplify it a little more if you want to, but uh, it's not really that necessary. Good, any questions about this one? Yeah, there is a question that it says, would this be an exam question? No, I don't want to correct this. So this no, would not be, of course, you, you should have, you should be able to, um, to invert matrices that have a parameter in them. But for the exam, I would never make it that long. For the exam, uh, the calculation should be a lot shorter. So the chance for, for making an error should, there should be a lot less chance of making an error in an exam question. Always keep in mind that I and my colleagues, of course, need to correct whatever you're doing. And uh, imagine you made a small mistake at the beginning and have to do all the computations until the very end to see how many consecutive errors there are. Um, and I don't want to do this. And none of my colleagues wants to do this either. Uh, then there is, uh, do we have to anticipate problems of this kind with this much effort and time for only one exercise in the exam? I guess this is already answered. Yes, right? I hope this is already answered, yes. So in principle, an exam question might be formulated like this, but of course you wouldn't have to spend that much effort on it. Yeah, it wouldn't be, the computations wouldn't be so complicated. 
Then there is like a question, like a couple of questions that it says like they might get like different signs in, in different places. Um, well, I, I really tried to follow the, the computations done in the Blackboard right now and I didn't, I didn't really spot it any other mistake. Uh, just maybe tried to, to to compare your solution with the one that will be posted online. I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm not sure whether we can really go like, it's a need plus the second half of the term in the first row, first column. I don't know whether we can really go with that. So of course I published this in the suggested solutions as well. Um, the way I computed it there is a little different from what I did here, but I think the result should be the same. So you can always compare those steps to whatever you did and see um, where you, where you went wrong, hopefully. I hope I didn't go wrong anywhere. Uh, but of course, uh, there's always a chance that I make a mistake as well. So if you spot an error, then please just let me know and I'll be happy to, to reconsider my approach. Um, then there is a question that says, what does where possible mean in the description of beam? Ah, okay. I didn't get it in, well, this means related to part A, if it is not invertible, right? Yeah. So if it is not invertible, it couldn't be possible to to compute the inverse. Yes. So where possible means whenever like the the values of lambda allows that you have an invertible and the inverse of the matrix A lambda. Correct. Correct. So the meaning of part B is compute the inverse of A lambda wherever it exists. So for all values of lambda where this inverse exists. And from part A, we know what those values are. And of course we use those assumptions in the computation. Yeah. So you, you notice, I assume that lambda is not equal to two and I assume that lambda is not equal to two over seven because otherwise I would have divided or multiplied by factors of zero somewhere. And of course I don't, I cannot do that. So I'm using the knowledge from A to do the computations in B. If I didn't have those, then whenever I um, encounter such a step, like dividing by some lambda expression or multiplying a line around by some lambda expression, then I would have to make a case distinction. Um, and that would be, if that expression is zero, then something else might happen. So for the moment, assume it's not zero, that means lambda is not equal to this and that value. Make a note of that value. And then at the end, we'd have to look at those values and see if it works for those maybe in some different way or if it doesn't work for those, right? That's not necessary here because I have that knowledge from part A already. If you didn't have that, you'd have to infer it during this inversion process. Then maybe uh, quickly, I kind of like tried to answer that question, but I'm not sure whether like my, my answers could be like clear enough because I never got any feedback about it. Um, in exercise 5.2b, it says is b invertible, and we have computed that the determinant of b is not equal to zero. So from there, we can already conclude that b is invertible. Um, five two. Sorry, which one was it? Five two c. B. B. Five two b. So in five two b, uh, yes, the determinant was eighty. That's not zero. So then the matrix is invertible, that's right, yeah. So in general, if the determinant of a matrix is not zero, then it is invertible and vice versa. And then that when is... I said yes, that, that the, the, the matrix is invertible, the question was, isn't the rank of B smaller than N? So we have a four by four matrix. That means if it is invertible, the rank must be four in this case. Uh, and I don't see why it shouldn't be actually. No, I mean, like it is because I did also compute it in MATLAB. So it is um, whenever we have a square matrix and the determinant is not equal to zero, then we can conclude that it has full rank. Yes. So, so. If, if we know it's invertible, then we also know it has to have full rank. Um, so the, the matrix in part B must have rank four. I didn't explicitly compute that, but of course you can do that. You should get rank four. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, and, one of us is wrong. Sorry, yeah. Maybe now quickly we can go to the quiz and exam questions that they were in the beginning. Yes, so let's talk about uh, exam questions.
So the first question, I think this is kind of like related to those students that would like to travel to their home countries and maybe not able to come back for the exam period. Is there any way to give uh, the exam online? I would also like to ask if there will be a remote exercise option for the exam. Like. Okay, so as it stands currently, the exam is going to be held on campus. Uh, but as I said in the beginning of the semester, this is my current plan and that might change um, depending on how the pandemic evolves until January. Uh, it's really hard to make a prediction for mid-February right now. I'm hoping we'll be able to hold the exam on campus and then there will not be a remote option. Um, of course, I cannot promise that this will really be the case, right? Depending on, I'll, I'll reevaluate after the Christmas holidays and then we we'll make a hopefully final decision. Um, so when it turns out that it's not safe to hold the exam in place, even with all the safety measures that we are having in place, um, then we might have to switch to the remote option. I don't want to do that really um, because it has a number of downsides, but, at least we'll have to keep that option open until that time. So I would say at the moment, you should make plans for traveling to Munich by February so that you can take the exam. Um, but I cannot promise you that there will not be an online option. So um, just for those who can't make it to Munich by February, there is always the option of doing the retake that is going to take place in April. So there's some time left for that one. Again, I'm hoping we can do this on campus and I'm currently planning to do this on campus, but I can't make any promises. Uh, and uh, as this question is asked fairly often, you can take the retake without registering or without taking the first exam. So you don't have to be present for the first attempt and you don't even have to register for the first attempt if you just want to do the retake. But please keep in mind, there's not going to be an exam for this lecture in summer. So the next opportunity after the April retake will be February, 2022. So you should keep that in mind if you plan to forego the first attempt. Okay, so now coming to the quizzes, there is a question, it says, are we allowed to use a calculator for the quizzes or should we solve the task completely without calculator? Um, I would say it should be possible to do the quizzes without calculator. So my advice would be to not use it, but uh, you are allowed to use it if you want to. I hope the numbers are not too complicated. At least I haven't seen one with that complicated numbers, but uh, I can't make any promises here. Some of those are randomly generated. So maybe they randomly generated some complicated cases where you want to resort to using a calculator. And that's fine. If you want to do that, that's fine for the quizzes. Um, but you should be prepared to not use a calculator on the exam. Because if we can do the on-campus option, then there will not, you will not be allowed to use a calculator on the exam. So personally, I'd practice for that. Maybe one addendum to, to the exam question before. Um, I would be interested in people having difficulties to come to Munich in February and for the reasons. So if you're one of those people, then uh, it would be great if you could just write me a quick email um, giving some details about why you can't make it to Munich in February. Maybe that uh, will help us weighing our options when we have to make the final decision. Right. Uh, also a question regarding quiz. Uh, is it one quiz for the topics of week four and week five? It should be one quiz for each week. So for each topic, hopefully. Okay, and so far, uh, I don't think there are more questions in somebody, well, somebody's writing, maybe somebody writing fast. Otherwise, Maybe you can call. Okay, it's writing. Okay, coming. Okay, maybe I can uh, quickly talk about one organizational fact until then. Um, the evaluation of this lecture is going to take place next week. So not this week, but we're going to start with the evaluation next Monday. I'll make an announcement again when this happens, just so you are prepared. Um, I hope you will all be able and willing to give feedback. 
there is also a place to give text feedback. So if there's anything that you think we can improve or if there's anything you especially like about this course, um, then please leave a message in the text feedback. Those are often the most valuable. Um, I'll talk about the feedback once it's completed. I'll give you a quick overview, quick summary of that um, in a short video maybe or in the central exercise sessions, depends on the time that we have. Um, but generally, um, I'm, I'd be very happy to get your feedback because as you all know, it's very hard to get any feedback from you this semester. There's no personal contact. So um, I'm really happy about any feedback I can get. And if you feel there's something you'd like us to know, then please use the chat, use the forums, or also use the anonymous feedback option on Moodle. Um, if there's something that you, you want to tell us, we'll be very happy to get your message. So is there any new questions popping up? Yeah, the, the, still the same question about the quiz. The quiz of this week includes matrices, inverse, and determinants. So that's two weeks. And then the same person kind of like adds week four with matrices multiplication and week five with inverses. I haven't actually looked at this week's quiz, to be honest. Um, let me give this a look and I'll, I'll see if I can talk to my quiz masters to see what their intentions were. Isn't there a quiz for last week? Okay, well, we'll... We'll, we'll, well it should be a quiz uh, for last week, yes. Uh, will the quizzes be available before the exam again? Yes, we make the quizzes available a few weeks ahead of the exam, probably mid-January or so. You can't collect any more points then, of course, um, but we make the quizzes available for practice again. Yes. I mean, there are more questions coming. So maybe let's wait for one more question. And then of course, we'd be happy to answer all your questions in chat afterwards. So I'll have a look at the chat later on um, and see if there's anything that I can still answer in there. Are quiz questions similar to exam questions? In general, I would say yes. Of course, not every quiz question would make a good exam question because you have a week to think about the quiz question. So that might make a difference, but most quiz questions or parts of those would be good exam questions, I'd say, yes. Yes, to be sure, I can use Word. I use Microsoft Word for the exam, right? My handwriting is really bad. No, you can't use Microsoft Word for the exam. So. Again, the exam will hopefully take place on campus and you will have to write by hand on the paper that we supply. No electronic aids whatsoever. So you can't use Word then. And even if it takes place as a remote exam, um, I really suggest you don't use Word. It's really hard to write formulas in Word. At least it takes a lot of time, even if you have practice and uh, you're probably going to get some things wrong. So my advice is to not use Word and we would also not accept Word documents. You could print it out as a PDF, of course. We will accept PDF documents, but um, I'll give you more details on that option if we have to go this way. And um, currently I'm planning to have a practice run so that you can see how that remote system would work sometime before Christmas, probably the week before Christmas so that you get an idea of how this works. So uh, by the way, I think exam registration open today. So if you want to take part in that um, practice run that I'm planning for later in December, uh, then please do register for the exam. You can always unregister until mid January, I think. Um, but for the practice run, I have to have your data from the registrations. Otherwise I can't enroll you in the electronic system. But again, I'll make an announcement on this when it will happen. So probably I'll talk about this in, in a week or in two weeks, just as a quick announcement before. Okay, I think there are like a couple of like interesting questions and maybe after that we can call, call the, the exercises. So yeah. do we know if we are on track for the re rehearsal exam? I don't know what it means we are on track. Yeah, so the question here is probably, did you earn enough points uh, so that you still get a original exam? And the quiz is, uh, I am currently waiting for the evaluations from my quiz masters to see if that's the case. We'll publish that on Moodle, um, I guess, by the end of the week. So I think you are still on track. 
and would this be held online or in person? So, I mean, as we said, preferences. The rehearsal, no, that's that's not a quiz. That we, that's not something that we hold, uh, hold, hold in person, sorry. Uh, we just don't have the, the personnel and we don't have the rooms to do an actual rehearsal exam on campus. So if you get a rehearsal exam, that would mean I provide you with an exam and uh, then it's your take to actually rehearse with that exam. So you're responsible for taking your time, making this only 90 minutes, um, using the right aids. I'm not going to supervise you. Are we allowed to use a cheat sheet during the exam? Yes, if we go in for the on-campus option, then you are allowed to use a cheat sheet. So it's going to be closed book, but I will allow a cheat sheet. Um, and that would mean one page, one handwritten page um, of format DIN A4, um, and you can write on both sides, but it's just going to be one page. So please don't clue together two pages or things like that. Also no copies, no printouts, handwritten pages. And I think we can now close the session because there are no more questions and I think we have go gone through all of them. Okay, okay wonderful. So. Uh, uh, thank you all for attending the central exercise class. Thank you, Lissuri, for moderating the chat, for forwarding all the questions that you have. Um, I might put a few more details on the exam on the Moodle page because those questions seem to pop up very often. Um, again, if I do that, please keep in mind that is the current plan. It might change until next year, depending on how the situation evolves. So. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you all on Thursday in the tutorials, or at least in a week next Monday.